codes for this field. Um, uh, I'm going to be particularly talking about our code, but I want to talk in general about the need for community codes. Um, uh, so this is work, uh, the work on Astro Bear, oops, uh, the work on Astro Bear 2, the code I'm going to show you about is a, you know, long effort. Um, uh, Jonathan Carroll and Bowie are our senior programmers, um, but then you've already heard from Mark Parque Espinoza, Jason Nordhaus, you'll hear from, and Eric as well. So this is sort of the, you know, whole University of Rochester community, theoretical community. So, that is what we're doing. Um, okay, so why talk about this at all? Um, the study of aspherical planetary nebula, you know, has gotten to the point, I mean, we were always at this point, but now we're just able to do it. Um, to study, uh, or it involves many different kinds of physical processes. Interacting winds, ionization fronts, heterogeneous flows, clumpy flows. Um, we have, you know, we believe that binary star interactions are important, but they can take many different forms. So, for example, we've already talked about bonding coil flows earlier in the day. We talked about Roche lobe overflow. All of this fits together in the incredibly complex process known as common envelope evolution. And then somewhere uh, in all this is um, magneto hydrodynamic outflows. We have to understand how, we, you know, we've sort of left that part out up to now, and I think probably are almost the entire time in this meeting. But there's, you know, a number of different ways magnetic fields can be uh, used to drive outflows. So all these things are necessary. Um, and what that means is it's not just physical processes, it's specific kinds of physics you have to include in your code. So for example, all right, so MHD is absolutely, absolutely critical. We really are going to need MHD at least to drive the outflow. <coughs> but if you're doing MHD, then you need to consider resistivity because often cases you will have resistivity going on. And then if you do have heat conduction, heat conduction is going to completely change because of the presence of magnetic fields. You'll have what's called anisotropic heat conduction, where the heat conduction can only run along, the, the electrons can only run along the field lines. So that needs to be included. Um, you need to include radiation transfer, and that means both line radiation and continuum. So you know, those are very complicated processes to include with the fluid dynamics in a way that you know, the energy exchange is important. Um, you're moving both of them together at the same time. Microphysics is an endless topic. We have ionization, chemistry, their role in cooling. Um, you know, this is all, of course, the ionization, all this is going to couple with radiation transfer and it's going to couple with the MHD via the shocks that they form. And then in some cases, uh, you know, for example, if we're doing common envelope evolution, we're going to need self-gravity. And if we have binaries, we're going to need to do point particle dynamics. So all of these things need to be simulated. Um, let me just give you an example of what I mean by the complexity here. So this is, uh, this is just a small piece of a simulation of two colliding flows where self-gravity is uh, able to work. And what I was showing you there was a single proto-star cluster that had formed in one of our simulations. And those are both uh, fields, flow fields and magnetic fields. So just to give you a taste, and that's just a small region of the flow. So the problem that we're trying to take on is really in computational physics what we call a grand challenge problem. And grand challenge problems should not be done by isolated groups that don't talk to each other, right? In general, um, you know, the, the astro com computational astrophysics has sort of moved in this direction of community codes. And in general, you need more than one. What do I mean, what mean by a community code? It's a code that's used by more than one research group, often use of shared development resources. In some sense, it's kind of open source. Um, and so, you know, for an adaptive mesh refinement, which is the kind of code I want to talk to you about today, there's things like Flash and Enzo and other codes like this. And, you know, when one picks up a code, like, uh, for a specific problem, there tends to be a lot of work by different people, perhaps in the same code, to work on that problem. And certainly what we're doing with common envelope evolution, binaries, and MHD, requires that. It requires us all, perhaps, not to be working in eight different codes, but maybe two or three different codes, because there's so much subtlety in terms of um, the development of uh, um, uh, initial conditions and, and uh, uh, boundary conditions that it's difficult and subtle, and just taking a code off the shelf may not be the best way if you're just getting started. And you need to develop a broad community of people who have code expertise. Some people are going to be just users, they just want to take the code and run simulations of disks. Um, some people are going to be developers who are going to be adding the new heat conduction module to it. So you need sort of both types. Now an example, we already have an example of a community code 
code that's emerging in this field, and that's shape. Um, now, that's not necessarily specifically for simulation, but they now have added simulation to it, and I think that's really a wonderful addition. So what I want to talk to you today is about uh, another code, the code that we've been developing as a possibility of a community code, and that's AfterBear 2.0. We've, we've been working on this for a decade, and we've only recently gotten to the point where we feel it's up to snuff to release into the community. Um, and our funding has come from you know, a variety of sources that allows us now to have, you know, we've got all we've got full complement of graduate students and postdocs, but also some senior programmers who can help with, if someone wants to take on the code, can help them just get it installed. That's the first part. Remember, this is a parallel adaptive measure finding code that I'm going to tell you about. And so um, one of the things, you know, getting into it is non-trivial. And so one of the things we developed is a, uh, this wiki for, um, you know, users. And I'll talk about this a little bit more as we go along. We've spent a lot of time trying to think about how people pick up a code like this. All right, so what are we actually simulating? This is from the first paper on uh, Astro Bear from 2009. What we're doing is we're solving these hyperbolic partial differential equations. These are the equations of MHD. Notice this source term over here, all kinds of crazy things. This is where all the multi-physics is going to go. Um, because it's MHD, we have to solve the del, del dot B equals zero constraint, so we don't generate magnetic monopoles. So we have source terms for energy loss, ionization dynamics. We can do a real equation of state, if that's what you're interested in. Um, we have gravity, heat conduction, uh, viscosity, um, resistivity, et cetera. And then we have sink particles so we can do particle dynamics and accretion explicitly. So this is the system, this is the system that you're solving with an enormous amount of stuff hidden in there. Okay? Now the important part about this is we're solving it on an adaptive mesh, uh, on a grid that's refining it. I'm sure everybody knows this, but just to put too fine a point on it. Adaptive mesh refinement means you're going to update, um, you're going to add new refinement where you need it. Okay, so this is the base grid, very low resolution. The code identifies where interesting things are happening, puts a higher level grid on top of it, um, and then uh, even more puts an even higher level above, above that. So you can have as many grids as you want uh, until you run out of uh, uh, memory um, or computer time. Uh, and the important thing to understand that doing this in MHD is really not trivial. There are incredible divergence issues. Like one, one of the great hurdles to get through in numerical fluid dynamics in MHD was not developing magnetic monopoles. And this is actually a psychotic problem once you start having all these grids. So one of the things that uh, really one needed to work out was what are called prolongation and restriction operators that take you from the low resolution to the high resolution to the highest and back again without generating any monopoles. So Astro Bear does this. We developed our own method for doing it. Um, and then the other important thing is the scaling uh, with the code, right? If you're doing a 3D problem with lots of physics, multi-physics as we call it, you're going to end up needing massively parallel. It doesn't have to be massively parallel. You can do smaller you know, project. But if you want the really high resolution. And so um, one of the strange things about adaptive mesh refinement and parallel is they're trying to do the same thing in two different directions. Parallel tries to, you know, we farm out your, your uh, simulation to lots of different processors and you hope they never have to talk to each other. Because every time they talk to each other, it slows things down. AMR tries to um, break this computational space up into just those regions where you need high resolution. And that means you're adding grids all over the place, so everybody has to talk to everybody else. So trying to get a parallel AMR code is um, really not true. And so this just shows you the scaling that we have for the, our code from 12 processors to over 10,000 processors. And these lines, basically, the code's doing well if you're staying around an efficiency of one. And you can see here the green line, uh, the blue line is for fixed grid, one level, four levels, and you see even with four levels, we're doing pretty well. So we put a lot of effort into this. This, is, of course, depends on the problem. Uh, we, have, of course, have chosen to show you these best results. Um, but even with really complex problems, we do pretty well. But that's a place where if somebody else is working with us, we can help you fine-tune your parallelism. Okay, so what is Astro Bear? What's the idea behind it? The code was designed to be easy to use with a minimal uh, knowledge of adaptive mesh refinement. You don't have to go into the adaptive mesh refinement parts of the code to get it to work. Um, uh, commonly used initial and boundary conditions are easy to generate. We use an idea of objects. So if you want to put a disk with a wind inside and have the wind run out into the disk, we have sort of objects that you can place easily um, uh, into the grid in that way. Uh, there's many ways. This is one of the things that's really important about uh, adaptive mesh refinement. Why do you choose, what do you choose to refine on? The normal thing is just say, oh, I see a density gradient. Let me put more resolution there. 
Well, you could also refine on magnetic fields. You could refine on places where you know self gravity is important. So it's easy to control that in uh, Astro Bear. Um, and we also have a, a number of runtime uh, and analysis of the data because, of course, what you're getting out of a simulation is not just a big cube of data. You're getting lots of cubes, and you have to know where to put the cubes, right? You know, each cube is a grid of data of different resolution. So um, we have a bunch of things to sort of aid the analysis of this data rather than sort of having to build it all yourself. Um, and so it can also be used as uh, you know, this post processing this uh, data can be complicated. So you can actually use the code, some of this is built in to do the post processing. Okay. Um, all right, so I'll run through some of this. We have a ticketing system for helping people uh, you know, work through the code if interesting things. If something breaks, you can add a ticket and then we'll try and help you. Um, I won't go through this in any great detail, but you can certainly see me. Let me just run through a couple of things that the code is used for. This is some of the work that Martin did uh, last year. These are uh, pointing flux dominated flows. You can see these very complicated magnetic fields here. These are the magnetic, this is a ta magnetic tower that will be generating one of the planetary nebula that we see. So this is just pure MHD. Um, here is a MHD jet. Run that. So these are different, that's hydro, uh, all the way to extremely magnetic, strong magnetic fields. And this illustrates the code's uh, um, ionization and microphysics capability. Green there is H alpha, red is sulfur 2. We're calculating that on the fly so we can make good synthetic observations. Uh, I won't talk about this in any detail. This is heat conduction. What I have here is hot and cold gas with a tangled magnetic field. I won't show you the simulation, but we were, this is a, some work we did with Shul Lee, one of my students. You can track the anisotropic heat conduction in our code and watch how the um, cold material bleeds off uh, because of um, uh, heat conduction, but only where you can get through these magnetic islands. Um, let me just show you this one, the simulation on the left here, on the right, excuse me. This just shows you how AMR is working um, in the case where you're actually in the, the, uh, the frame, in the lab frame. So Martin showed you stuff that was in the co-rotating frame. So um, this is actually just a test calculation, but you see what the AMR is doing, right? The AMR is zooming in on, just on the particle, allows you to, you know, speed up these calculations enormously. That just shows the velocity vectors. I think I'm almost done here. I won't show you this. One thing I do want to show, though, is just uh, we have. Um, can you click on this? Oops. Yes. So we, just, we have our own YouTube channel where we put up uh, simulations. So if you want to come, this is a, a, a magnetized clump being shot um, with a strong toroidal field that totally affects its dyna dynamics. Um, comes to sort of bullet shape because of the strong toroidal field in it. Um, this gives you also a sense of the 3D dynamics. So if you want to go, if you go to uh, U, uh, UVAR Astro Bear on YouTube, you can see the whole range of simulations. And I guess if we just want to click to the end here, I'll summarize. Whoops. Um, okay, so this is just to, to finish. We work on a collaborative model. The code is available to anybody. You can download it and start working with it. But you know, if, what we would like is to try and establish collaboration so we can help you use it. If you're just a naive user and you're just downloading it, you know, if you ask for help, we'll try to get to you, but you know, we're not a giant software company. So what we tend to do is we try and establish collaborations and then have those collaborations collaborate so that everybody's working together to, for example, develop a effective common envelope formalism. Uh, you know, there's so many problems in common envelope that we don't have to be worrying about stepping on each other's toes. We can farm these things out. We can collaborate effectively. Um, this is just a list of some of the people who, uh, this is a partial list. Rice University, University of Michigan, University of Washington. We're doing everything from YSO jets to hot Jupiter atmospheres, the Galaxy Center, Mark Morris has picked it up, uh, young Earth atmospheres. So, you know, this has proven to be a fairly robust collaborative model, and I will stop there and take questions if anybody has them, or please come talk to me afterwards. Thank you. You know, 
it's actually getting all of these different efforts, right? Just like shape is really designed for the interpretation of data. You know, Astro Bear is going to be something that's really designed for, you know, doing sort of hardcore simulations with lots of physics. Um, and we'll probably need the base of data in order to initialize our, our grids. Yeah, there are two papers that describe MESA and uh, app supplements. One in 2013 and one in 2010 or 2011. Paxton, P-A-X-T-O-N et al. If you're interested in stellar structure and evolution. So I have a question. You showed your simulation. I see you want to flip to a stability. That was a 2D simulation. Yeah, so in 3D it does not, that does not happen. If I could just say, I mean, one thing I guess what I'm asking is, we don't want, I mean, I don't want Astro Bear to become the only code that's being used here, but I don't think it really helps us if we're using nine different codes, right? If the, if the code, use of the codes is shallow, meaning that you take it down from the shelf and you do something and then you drop it, right? Because we've got some really deep problems we need to solve and it's going to require some mixture of effort. So, you know, with our Ursula working together with, you know, they're using Enzo, but for us to be able, just like what happens in the global climate models, right? When there's discussion among the groups as you go deeper into the subgrid models, etc., I think that's what really has to happen for us to take on some of these very difficult problems. Don't bring these climate things to spoil. <laughs> hey, I'm doing atmospheres now. Any, any more comment? Yeah, yes? How is that something like No, we don't just wait. How did you find a chair so far away? There's a better forming back there. Yeah, so how is the dust component included in the code? Um, we don't actually have a dust component in there, but that would not be difficult to do because we have um, uh, uh, tracers in there. So, for example, ionization is handles the tracers. So you can add as many tracers as you want, and that's one of the things actually that the next step we're going to do is we'll build in a dust model, that'll, a dust fluid that will be coupled to the gas to be able to do more effective um, wind launching. Okay. okay, good. We have more talks from this book. So. So, how much uh, cash in the uh, complex of simulation is now?